The Sequence of Bible Prophecy Humanity in the Crosshairs of History Part 3 We need to realize that there is more going on under the surface, more going on behind the scenes than we realize. As we continue this quest to identify the prophecy bits and pieces that fill in many of the gaps and details that make up many parts of the prophetic sequence, we need to navigate through the writings of the other biblical prophets. That's because there are many small parts that make up the whole. We need to start with a brief look at the men Eloheinu used to deliver the prophetic messages to his people that we'll draw from as we begin the process of reconciling them with each other in the context they best fit in. To say the least, it's a complicated balancing act. We need to balance these components on the broad historical foundation that Daniel has laid out for us and then layer them together as we discover the relevant and appropriate places they fit as part of the more comprehensive whole. And our task is going to begin here. Joel, the day of Yahweh cometh. Joel was the first prophet sent to the kingdom of Judah. He is one of those prophets that seemingly come out of nowhere, and while brief, he leaves your head spinning with a message full of vivid imagery. While not much is known about him, the contents of his Day of Yahweh message are found throughout all other Last Day messages. Joel's message is filled with some of the most striking and specific details in all of Scripture about the Day of Yahweh. He describes days cloaked in darkness, armies that conquer like a consuming fire, the moon turning to blood. One commentator notes that the day of Yahweh is a reference not to just a single day only, but a period of judgment and restoration consisting of three basic features, the judgment of Yahweh's people, the judgment of foreign nations, and the purification and restoration of Yahweh's people through intense suffering. This coming time of ultimate judgment makes clear the seriousness of Yahweh's judgment on sin. Isaiah, the prophet to princes and the prince of prophets. While not the first, Joel preceded him by about a hundred years. He was by far the most influential and it was through his prophecies that the concept of the day of Yahweh was introduced in regard to judgment, chastisement, punishment, and retribution for the sins of mankind in the last days. The two reoccurring messages found throughout the writings of Isaiah revolve around the themes of justice and righteousness. While best known as the most quoted prophet in the New Testament, and the prophet who was given the largest number of specific messianic prophecies outside of the Psalms, Isaiah is also responsible for giving us significant details concerning the coming last days. As a brief aside, did you know that a complete copy of Isaiah, written around 125 BC, was one of the original seven Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in 1947? It's written in ancient Hebrew, and the scroll is on display today in Israel and can be read by modern Israelis without the need of any translation. A scroll just like this would have been available in any synagogue that Jesus would have attended. The Isaiah scroll came into the possession of the newly reborn state of Israel shortly after their official declaration of independence and subsequent war. Many consider the scroll to be a sign for the modern nation of Israel. Just for the sake of perspective, approximately 100 years before Daniel and Ezekiel were introduced onto the prophetic scene, Isaiah was commissioned by God to serve as prophet, counselor, and spokesman to five kings of Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh. While most responded favorably to Isaiah's message, the evil king Manasseh martyred Isaiah by having him sawn in two. Zephaniah, the royal prophet of wrath and redemption. The short book of Zephaniah opens with a declaration of looming judgment and coming doom. Zephaniah chapter 1 says, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth. Near is the great day of Yahweh, a day of wrath. The prophecies of Zephaniah are noteworthy in that he refers to the day of Yahweh more than any other prophet. To put Zephaniah's message in perspective, the kingdom of Judah was spiraling farther down the path of rebellion under the leadership of Manasseh and Ammon. 
and there was only a brief respite under the leadership and reforms of Josiah. Zephaniah began his ministry during this time of respite, and because he was the great-great-grandson of King Hezekiah and directly related to the royal lineage that included Manasseh and Ammon, Zephaniah was uniquely qualified to speak to the sins of Judah's leadership. It also means he was related to the prophet Daniel, who was also of the royal line. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. For 225 years, Eloheno set his prophets to plead with the rulers and the people of Judah to repent from their wicked ways and to return to worship and obedience to Yahweh. With that call to repentance also came a warning of Yahweh's coming judgment. Jeremiah's message to the people was, the time has come. Jeremiah was the final voice of warning and the first voice of anguish and horror as the kingdom of Judah took their final steps into the abyss of Yahweh's promised judgment. The time of warning had passed. The time of chastisement had begun. Jerusalem was overtaken and the temple was destroyed. Jeremiah's life and ministry were equally divided between the final years before the exile and the first years of the exile. His message was the hinge that swung from horror to hope. And for the sake of perspective, specifically of importance to us is Jeremiah's prophecies recorded in chapters 25 and 29. Jeremiah 25 says, Therefore thus saith Yahweh Tzabaot, Because you have not obeyed my words, this whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Jeremiah 29 says, For thus saith Yahweh, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and causing you to return to this place. Because it was the reading of these specific words that led Daniel to the discovery of the seventy weeks of years prophecy. Daniel 9, 1 and 2 says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years whereof the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Zechariah, prophet to the returned. Zechariah was a priest and a prophet. When he was younger, it is highly probable that he worked alongside the older prophet Haggai, delivering messages of caution and encouragement to the remnant of recently returned exiles from Babylon. Zechariah provided specific prophecy about their immediate and distant future, which was no doubt a great encouragement. The book of Zechariah contains the clearest and largest number of messianic passages found among the minor prophets. He sees both the first coming of Messiah as well as his second coming, and according to Zechariah he will come as Savior, Judge, and ultimately as the righteous King ruling his people from Jerusalem. Zechariah concluded his book by looking into the distant future, first at the rejection of the Messiah by Israel, and then at his eventual reign when Israel will finally be delivered. Again, for the sake of perspective, one year after Daniel has the vision of the 70 weeks of years, Zechariah has a vision that introduces us to four horses patrolling the earth, Zechariah chapter 1, 7 through 10. Only one of them has a rider. These horses bear a striking similarity to the four horses recorded in Revelation. Also of note is the fact that it is the prophet Zechariah that provides us with the prophecy detailing the triumphal entry of Jesus on his way to his death for us. This specific prophecy, as we have already seen, signals the completion of Daniel's 69th week of years. Now it's time to start putting this stuff all together. Now that we've identified where some of our prophetic puzzle pieces will come from, it is now time to start putting them into place sequentially and building up the necessary levels where needed. Ezekiel, the other prophet in Babylon. Did you know that in the modern day city of al Kifl, Iraq, which is roughly 50 miles south of Baghdad, was found within the tomb of the prophet Ezekiel 66 marble and basalt tablets on which were inscribed the complete writings of this ancient prophet. They were etched in ancient Hebrew and in base relief on the entire surface on one side. 
They were purposely placed in Ezekiel's tomb with the writing obscured, with only the blank side of the tablets visible until they were found a little over a hundred years ago. A Talmudic legend states that the original book of Ezekiel was buried in his tomb and was left there to be revealed to Israel as a sign in the last days. Ezekiel was a Jewish priest of the lineage of the high priest. He was taken into captivity when he was approximately 25 years old, after the walls of Jerusalem were breached by Nebuchadnezzar in 597 BC. Ezekiel would have realistically taken part in official temple duties before he and his family were relocated to Tel Aviv, a city approximately 100 miles northwest of Babylon on the banks of the Euphrates, with the other exiles during Zedekiah's reign, eight years after the first group of exiles were taken of which Daniel was part of, and ten years before the final fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. God's call to Ezekiel came to him around 593 BC, five years after he was taken captive. From this time forward, his message and prophecies can be divided into two distinct segments. For the first seven years, his message and prophecies concerning the kingdom of Judah was of judgment to come which culminated in the destruction of the temple and the complete exile of Judah. In the 15 years following the exile, Ezekiel's message and prophecies concerning Israel and Judah changed to one concerning the restoration to come. For the sake of perspective, Ezekiel was probably just a few years older than Daniel, and his final message was recorded about halfway into Daniel's ministry around the same time when Daniel had just interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream concerning the madness that would come upon him for seven years because of his hubris and pride. There is no further word from Ezekiel after this time. The portion of Ezekiel's prophecies that we are interested in fall within the Restoration to Come segment of his ministry. Delivered in the years between the time Nebuchadnezzar had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrust into a fiery furnace and the time that he succumbed to his prophesied madness. And for the purposes of our searching for a last day sequence, we're only going to focus on a few specific prophecies. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, and I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. Ezekiel 34, 11, and 13. The trigger is being set. Thus saith the Lord God, Because the enemy hath said against you, Aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession, because they have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side that you might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen, and are an infamy of the people. Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because you have borne the shame of the heathen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I have lifted my hand. Surely the heathen that are about you, they shall bear their shame. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you. Ezekiel 36, 1-9 through Can these bones live? Ezekiel chapter 37, 3 through 5 says, And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Ah, Lord God, you know. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you out of your graves. Ezekiel 37, 12-13 The Trigger Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Isaiah 66, 8. On May 15, 1948, three years after the Holocaust and almost 2,000 years in exile, 
the independent nation of Israel was rebirthed onto the world stage. Immediately attacked by five well-trained, well-armed Arab armies commanded by officers from some of the world's major powers, the frail, untrained, and ill-equipped Holocaust survivors prevailed. Did you know that the state of Texas is 33 times larger than the tiny nation of Israel? The entire western edge of the country is situated on the Mediterranean Sea, and it is surrounded on the three remaining sides by countries significantly larger than Israel. These hostile countries have consistently exhibited a demonic intent on destroying them. In chapter 17 of Isaiah, we find a series of three obscure prophetic verses that may have growing significance in light of current events and be pointing us to a possible trigger. If placing the fulfillment of this prophecy at this point in the sequence of events is correct, the fulfillment of these prophetic verses may be the point where things begin to move forward rapidly. Isaiah 17.1 Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Damascus is recognized by the UNESCO World Heritage Center as one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. The city has been conquered many times over the past 4,000 years, but it has never been completely destroyed. That means Isaiah 17.1 has not yet been fulfilled. The first mention of Damascus in the Bible is found in Genesis 14.1, when Abraham rescued Lot from Amraphel and the three other kings that went to war with Sodom and Gomorrah in the second millennia BC. Jasher 16.1 says that this Amraphel is Nimrod, and many scholars are in agreement with him. Isaiah 17.2 The cities of Aror are forsaken, they shall be for flocks which lie down, and none shall be afraid. Archaeology has confirmed the location of the ancient cities of Aror. They are located on the east side of the Dead Sea in the country of Jordan. Isaiah 17.3 says, The fortress shall also cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom, or dominion, from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. When Joshua allocated the land to the tribe of Ephraim in the Promised Land, their tribal borders fell into what is currently known as the West Bank. Currently, Ephraim is a Palestinian stronghold. Damascus has been a seat of power ruled by Islamic leaders since 634 AD and under some form of Turkish domination since 878 AD up until 1946. Turkey wants it back. The significance of this current geopolitical alignment should not be ignored, nor should it be underestimated. Over the years, we have seen conflicts and increasing terrorist activity coming from both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. If in the future we observe coordinated activity between these two areas in conjunction with Hezbollah forces in Lebanon, the stage will be set for a much larger confrontation. We have been watching with concern the increasing presence and activity of Turkish and Iranian forces in Syria. Turkey wants to reassert the old Ottoman Empire rule and Iran wants to increase their presence and influence through the Syrian corridor. We have seen Israel launch an increasing number of preemptive strikes directly into Syria to counter the Iranian and Turkish military buildup. Given the catalyst previously described, we could see events quickly escalate into a direct military confrontation between the nations of Israel and Syria. Let's be honest. Given Israel's well-known military capabilities, superiority, and prowess, it would be quite possible that both the Palestinians and Syria will be overpowered. This will put Jordan in the uneasy position of either being encouraged or forced to join in the conflict. It is a widely known and undisputed fact that the Islamic countries surrounding Israel consider Israel's existence an insult to the Islamic religion. Their religion virtually demands that they wait and make plans to wipe the Jewish nation off the face of the earth at the first opportunity given to them. If Israel becomes militarily overwhelmed and they find themselves faced with the prospect of defeat and annihilation, Israel will exercise their Samson option and will inflict tactical nuclear devastation on her surrounding enemies. The result could very well become the fulfillment of Isaiah 17, 1 through 3. The Islamic nations of the world Remember that word Daniel used to describe the mingling of iron with clay, Arab? 
will view this as a slap in the face to the religion and a direct insult to Allah and become infuriated. This will result in a global call for retribution and jihad, which will rapidly spread. I personally believe this will set in motion one of the most anticipated and yet least understood prophetic events recorded in Scripture, the Battle of Gog of the land of Magog. Ezekiel 38, 1-4 says, The word of Yahweh came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, This is what Adonai Yahweh says, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen, fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields all of them brandishing their swords. To be perfectly honest, trying to understand the topic of the coming war of Gog is complicated, and trying to find a consensus among current interpretations is difficult. For years, people have devoted a lot of time, research, and scholarship using linguistics, geography, migration patterns, and historical accounts in an attempt to identify who and where the players in this end-time drama are today. Nothing of certainty has been found yet. I believe, it's my opinion, that Yahweh is using Ezekiel 38 to allow us to see the mingling of celestial rebels and their human counterparts, along with the mingling of the earthly territories they influence and control, as they are being pushed toward a coming day of judgment. We are shown that these rebel forces are controlled and forced by the sovereign hand of Yahweh onto the end time stage to participate in the closing scenes of their own destruction. As an example, I will put hooks in your jaws and bring you forth, Ezekiel 38, 4. So who is Gog? We can see that Yahweh is directing this prophecy in Ezekiel 38, not at a person and not at a country, but rather a spiritual entity known as Gog an entity that is somehow closely associated with a geographical location identified as Magog. And apparently this same entity holds a position of rank that is considered to be the chief prince or head, Rosh, controlling entity of two other geographical locations called Meshach and Tubal. Could we be talking about sacred mountains? Ezekiel 38.15 says, and you shall come from your place out of the north parts. In verse 15, we are given information that tells us that this entity called Gog has a makom, a place, a designated home, a station, an abode, a region located in the Yaraka, extreme parts, recesses, or side of somewhere in a location called Safon, the north. There just happens to be a mountain called Safon. It is due north of Jerusalem. It is located on the Mediterranean coast on the border between Turkey and Syria, and it's considered to be the Near Eastern version of Mount Olympus. It has a long history of being a sacred mountain. It is the home of the Hittite god Teshub. It is the home of the Akkadian and Ugaritic god Baal Safon and his sister Anat. It's the Greco-Roman sanctuary to Zeus Cassios. It is the sanctuary to the Roman god Jupiter. They're all one and the same. So who makes up this confederacy? And exactly how large and how widespread is it going to be? What we do know for sure is that when we look into the table of nations found in Genesis 10, we find the majority of the names in Ezekiel 38 directly associated with the migration of five of Japheth's sons and one grandson and two of Ham's sons. After Yahweh confused the languages at the Tower of Babel, all of the descendants of Noah and his sons divided up into tribes of common speech and dispersed into different parts of the world. While not exact, there are some clues as to the general direction they went. The tribes of Japheth are commonly known to have moved to the north and east and to the north and west from the ancient city of Eridu, the city where the remains of the unfinished Tower of Babel are located. As they began to settle in the Anatolian area, their descendants later became associated with the Hurrian culture. Japheth's son Magog 
settled his tribes in the central part of Anatolia, in what is now Turkey. This would become the area where the Hittite kingdom emerged. Japheth's son Meshech settled in eastern Anatolia and became known as the Mitanni, and his son Tubal settled in northern Anatolia along the coast of the Black Sea and became associated with the ancient Kaska and Tumana peoples. Japheth's son Gomer settled in northwestern Anatolia, also known as the Ahiyawa Kingdom, before continuing their move into Europe. And Japheth's grandson, Gomer's son, Togarma, settled in southeastern Anatolia along the Aegean Sea as the Arzawa Kingdom. Mahdi, the last son of Japheth mentioned in Ezekiel 38, is not called out by his name but by his epithet, Persia, which means pure or splendid. The tribes of Mahdi began moving east of Anatolia and originally settled in what we know as Iran today. The remaining names mentioned in Ezekiel's end-time confederacy are two of Ham's sons. Ham and his tribes moved west of Eridu and then south, moving through the Levant and into the African continent. Ham's son Cush, called Ethiopia in the text, was the father of the infamous rebel Nimrod, instigator of the building of the Tower of Babel. After they left Eridu, Cush moved his family's tribes almost due south of Eridu to the coastland areas along the Red Sea, Arabian Sea, and the Indian Ocean. The tribes of Ham's son Put, called Libya in the text, occupied the coastal region in North Africa along the Mediterranean coast. 4,000 years ago, archaeology has shown this area was at one time a very fertile, very lush, well-watered and highly productive growing zone in the ancient world. All indications tell us that at one time conditions were similar if not extending up into the Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia. Ezekiel 38, 1-6 This is what Adonai Yahweh says, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets, also Gomer, with all its troops, and Beth Togarma, from the far north, with all its troops, and the many nations with you. If you take a look at the map of the Ezekiel 38 Confederacy we just lined out, and a map of the Islamic Empire, they look similar. Is this a coincidence? According to Ezekiel 38, Yahweh is going to force a confrontation with the principality known as Gog, also known as Teshub, Marduk, Baal, Zeus, Jupiter, and Saturn, that uses as his base of operations a sacred mountain called Mount Siphon, located in Turkey. This spiritual ruler will assemble an alliance of earthly nations that we can see look strangely similar to many Islamic nations we know of today as a response to what may have been the nation of Israel's fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 17 prophecies. This principality is going to coordinate a military response to Israel's apparent Isaiah 17 victory and will want to exact revenge on targeting the nation of Israel, which happens to be home of another sacred mountain called Mount Zion. In times past, and we know will happen once again in the future, Mount Zion will be the earthly base of operations in the next end-time prophetic phase for Yahweh and his son Jesus, who will sit on the throne of David as King of Kings and Lord of Lords on that mountain. Gog will bring together a very large, well-equipped, demonically inspired and demonically empowered military strike force made up of fallen men who are faithful followers of the Horned One. They will launch an attack on the nation of Israel with the ultimate goal of defeating the Elohim the Jewish people represent, negating the promises Yahweh made to them totally eradicating the Jews that have returned to the land and destroying the religion the Jewish people stand for. The Islamic crescent and star motif is seen and recognized throughout all Islamic nations. But it is a motif that did not originate, nor is it exclusive to Islam. The root of this symbol and the ancient celestial rebel it represents and the pantheon it is associated with goes back to more ancient times and a much, much older religion.
In the days of ancient Sumer, the crescent symbol represented the Sumerians' oldest and most powerful Elohim. An Elohim who played a very well-established and long-standing role not only in Mesopotamian religion and mythology, but also in the earliest pre-Islamic religious pantheon. Originally known as Nana, but later called on by the name Sin, this deity was recognized as father of the Elohim, Anu, chief of the Elohim, Enlil, Marduk, creator of all things, Inki, Enuma, Elish, and Lord of Wisdom, Enzu, Nabu. Although many temples were dedicated to Nana throughout ancient Mesopotamia, his chief sanctuary city and seat of worship was located 11 and a half miles from Eridu at the great ziggurat located in what was once considered to be Ur of the Chaldees, located in modern-day Iraq. The second most important sanctuary city was in Haran, approximately 30 miles from San Alurfa, what is now an accepted site of Ur of the Chaldees, a city located in Turkey, and only 38 miles from the world's oldest known temple site of Gobekli Tepe. Coincidence? I have often asked myself, does Isaiah 17 equal Ezekiel 38 equal a trigger event? Isaiah 17, 12 through 13 says, Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the roaring of Yom, and to the uproar of nations that make a tumult like the crashing of desolating waters. The nations shall roar like the desolation of many waters, but Yahweh shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like the rolling thing before the whirlwind. Two noteworthy things are going to happen when the next prophetic move is made. One, the cosmic rebels and their human allies are going to be forced into open conflict with Yahweh once again. And second, the nation of Israel, now in the land in unbelief, will be forced to recognize the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ezekiel 38, 17 says, Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied that in the latter days I would bring you against them? Ezekiel 39, 7 and 8 says, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. The heathen shall know that I am Yahweh, Kadosh, by Israel. Behold, it has come, and it is done, saith Adonai Yahweh. This is the day whereof I have spoken. Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, It shall come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. You shall say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn your hand on the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods. Ezekiel 38, 10 and 12. And you shall come from your place out of the north, you and many people, a great company and a mighty army, and you shall come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days, and I will bring you against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. As this conflict unfolds, it will quickly become apparent to the nation of Israel that they are facing a true extinction-level event. There is nothing they can do to save themselves, and there will be no one willing to offer them help. Ezekiel 21, 3-5 says, and say to the land of Israel, Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I am against thee, and will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh from south to north, that all flesh may know that I, Yahweh, have drawn forth my sword out of his sheath. It shall not return any more. And Ezekiel 39, 7 and 8 tells us, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. The heathen shall know that I am Yahweh Kadosh Ba Israel. Behold, it has come, and it is done, saith Adonai Yahweh. 
This is the day whereof I have spoken. The proud and resourceful, the resilient and very capable nation of Israel that miraculously emerged from the ash heap of history and enjoyed military success through numerous wars and conflicts has stubbornly refused to officially recognize the existence of the one true Elohim of Israel until now. The secular nation of Israel will now be surrounded by a demonically empowered enemy that has them outnumbered, outgunned, and outmaneuvered, leaving the entire country and people with no options, no way of escape, and no help offered or coming. Their enemies are in the perfect position to annihilate Israel once and for all. All hands shall become feeble, and all knees shall become weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them. Shame shall be on all the faces, and baldness upon all their heads. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of Yahweh. Ezekiel 7, 17-19 For thus saith Yahweh, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Whereof do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Jeremiah 30, 5-7 Difficulty is the very atmosphere of miracle. It is miracle in its first stage. If it is to be a great miracle, the condition is not simply difficulty, but sheer impossibility. What happens next is pure divine miracle. Now, in the hour of Israel's most desperate need, the nation and the people officially bend their knees, bow their heads, and lift their voice in one accord to Yahweh, Elohe Israel, and humbly cry out and plead for their Elohim to help and deliver. And to their surprise, Yahweh hears and Yahweh answers. Did you know within Judaism there is found in Jewish writings a curious form of messianic hope that has led to the expectation of two messiahs? A messiah ben Joseph and a messiah ben David. Messiah ben Joseph or Mashiach ben Ephraim is expected to gather a great army from the reunited tribes and set up his kingdom in a restored Israel with Jerusalem as its capital. This will result in large armies from the surrounding nations to come and make war against them, as Ezekiel predicted, and will result in the death of Mashiach ben Joseph and many of his followers. Thereafter, Mashiach ben David will appear, raise Messiah ben Joseph and his faithful followers from the dead, and establish the final kingdom which will last forever. Psalm 78 tells us, then Yahweh awakened as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that roars by reason of wine, he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Isaiah 42 says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall rouse up jealous zeal like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Jeremiah 46 tells us, for this is the day of Adonai Yahweh Tzabaot, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. His sword shall devour. It shall be satiate and be made drunk with their blood. For Adonai Yahweh Tzabaot hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Yahweh is tightening the noose. The end is drawing near. The legions of heaven and the armies of hell are now poised to engage in the looming conflict Yahweh has forced upon Gog and all the celestial forces being used to control the vast army of their earthly minions they are manipulating to destroy Israel, the apple of Yahweh's eye. Gog's confrontation with Yahweh will result in a disastrous blow to the celestial rebellion. Zephaniah 2, 10 through 11 tells us, this they will have in return for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of Yahweh Tzabaot. Yahweh will be terrible unto them. He will famish all the Elohim of the earth, and men shall worship him. Everyone from his place, even all the isles, 
of the heathen. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith Yahweh, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Ezekiel 38, 18 and 19. I will remove the northern army far from you. I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, its vanguard pushed into the eastern sea, and its rear guard into the western sea, and its stench will rise, and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. Joel 2:20. On that day I will give Gog a burial ground there in Israel. The valley of those who pass by east of the sea, it will block off those who would pass by. So they will bury Gog there with all his horde, and they will call it the Valley of Haman Gog. Ezekiel 39:11. And the serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and consumed the flood, which the dragon poured out of its mouth. Revelation 12:15 and 16. According to Ezekiel's prophecies, the war with Gog is not going to be an ordinary battle, and neither will be the deliverance for Israel. Ezekiel 38, 19 and 20 tells us, Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea and the fowl of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. As the forces of Gog surround Israel and position themselves for the death blow, Yahweh will strike them down. The multitude of your enemies will become like fine dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passes away. Yea, it shall be at an instant Suddenly, you shall be visited by Yahweh Tzabaot with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and flame of devouring fire. And the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munition and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Isaiah 29, 5-8 Elohe Shamaim Ve'eretz is going to dramatically deliver Israel from this invading horde. The deliverance will be so dramatic that not only Israel, but all the world will know. According to Ezekiel's description, Yahweh will strike the earth and the entire globe will quake. It will be as though every tectonic plate will move at once and the surface of the earth will momentarily break free of its moorings. If an event of this magnitude takes place, even for just a few seconds, the resulting seismic, volcanic, and other geophysical effects it would produce will not only be felt all around the globe, the devastation and destruction it will cause is simply unfathomable and beyond imagination. Did you know that according to recent studies, over 40% of the world's total population live in 58 cities in close proximity to active tectonic plates? But Yahweh will be smiting the invaders with more than just great earthquakes. Isaiah 29.6 says, You shall be visited by Yahweh Tzabaoth with thunder, with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and flame of devouring fire. Ezekiel 38, 21 and 22 says, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith Adonai Yahweh. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. Mega earthquakes will tear through the planet, 
long dormant volcanoes will roar back to life with a vengeance, exploding with cataclysmic fury on every continent, creating violent storms that produce giant hailstones of never-before-seen sizes. Torrential rains falling like a vertical flood will leave nothing and no one untouched. Spectacular firestorms of lightning will lash out of ash-filled skies, fueling massive planetary static charge imbalances that will result in giant plasma discharges erupting skyward in populated and non-populated places alike. Earth will be in upheaval once again, and on the field of Gog's fateful battle, chaos, confusion, fear, and terror will drive the invading horde into a state of sheer madness that will cause them to turn on their self. And in a moment, it's done. Isaiah 17, 14 says, Behold, at evening tide, trouble. Before the morning, he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us and a lot of them that rob us. The invading horde will be destroyed. The sword of Islam will be forever broken. Israel will be divinely delivered and through that deliverance, they will rediscover the Elohim of their forefathers. The face of the world will be changed. Countries, kingdoms, empires, and civilizations will be destroyed. The plans and agendas of the old world orders will be no more. Humanity will now have to regroup, reorganize, and completely rebuild. Yahweh's deliverance of Israel and the cataclysmic defeat of Gog will set the celestial rebels back on their haunches and reduce the world of man to a smoldering heap of embers. Suddenly, the world stage will be reset, and in the process, it will set into motion a long-anticipated countdown. As survivors throughout the world begin to rise up from the ashes of the sudden onslaught of horrendous death, devastation, chaos, and rubble, we will see a radical new cast of characters being put into place. And emerging out of the fire and of the sea of this devastatingly raw chaos, a new beast, a new world order will be birthed. The curtain will soon open for history's final scene. Hillel ben Shakar and his army have but a short time to pick up the pieces and rearrange the stage before the final curtain opens. Whew. Time for another break. <laughs>